and or spotlight me when you're ready. Good morning. I am delighted that you have joined us here on Zoom for our worship service this first Sunday of Advent. This service on Zoom is an abbreviated version of the service that we have normally here in the sanctuary. If you would like to sing along with all of the verses of all of the carols, they are in video form in the worship kit that you should have gotten in your email just a little bit ago. The special music video is there as well. So uh, the order of worship for this service will be posted in the chat box. I believe it is getting posted right now. So if you are a participant, particularly, I encourage you to check that out for a second and make sure you will be ready when it is time to unmute yourself. It's easier for us to have you participate if we can hear you. So, and it's easier for us to have everyone else uh, participate if we can't hear you. I'm so sorry. It's just true. So uh, today's worship service involves more props, some of which I have put on, um, but I hope you have them. So you'll want to have your Peace of Christ sign. I am also hoping that you have the square Advent wreath that came in your Advent kit and at least one of the tea light candles that goes with it, plus something to light it with besides your own uh, dragon breath, which I'm pretty sure none of you have. Um, you, of course, as well, then, will need something to uh, use for communion. Hopefully, some of the homemade communion wafers that we have distributed recently so we can do that with a sense of unity. Um, there are a number of other announcements. We are still in need of flower sponsors for December 13th and December 20th. Uh, if you would be <clears throat> interested in sponsoring flowers for either of those Sundays, I encourage you to let me know or to get in touch with Becky Neely. We are having those flowers delivered to your house during this time when they're not coming here. Or if there's someone else you would have them like to have them delivered to, uh, that has been a very lovely way for people to uh, show care for one another during this time. There are numerous online signups going on right now. There's a flower sign up for 2021. There is also a sign up for our presents for our El Nido families. I believe there are about four presents left as of this morning. So if you have not signed up yet, I encourage you to take a look at that online sign up and uh, find a present that you can pick up. Along those same lines, we are inviting you to bring in cookies, homemade cookies uh, for our welcome Saturday guests. We would like to get those not this week, but next week, the week of December 6th. Um, but we'd like to have them here sometime between Sunday and Wednesday so that we can pack them all up into little goodie bags on Thursday. So we would love to have your homemade cookies for Welcome Saturday. A uh, number of things happening on Zoom this week. Senior Men's Coffee is as usual on Wednesday at 8. The Outreach and Christian Ed Committees will have their meeting this Thursday at 6.30. And the women's study will meet on Zoom on Friday at 1. There is a very uh, big event happening on Saturday that I really hope you will uh, help us spread the word about. Our uh, longest night service is usually held later in the season, um, but because we had to rethink it anyway, it seemed helpful to move it forward earlier in the season. So this coming Saturday, rather than an evening service, we will be having what is basically an open house in the prayer garden. Uh, from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m., we will have prayer stations set up for people to interact with individually to help process some of the many, many complicated emotions of having Christmas in a pandemic. So there is a Facebook event page. It was in Friday's email. I hope you will share that with your friends, that you will invite anyone that you know that is really struggling to let go of the grief and the rage and the fear and just the overall frustration that this year has brought to us. Set that aside, lift it up to God in prayer, ask God to release us, or just process those emotions a little bit. This is going to be an important time. As we said, that will be in the garden. We will be limiting entrance to the garden to about two or two, four people at a time, depending on household groupings. Uh, and of course, masks are required. So we spread it out over five hours. So there would be plenty of time for everyone to come 
and work through those prayer stations. So please uh, do help us spread the word about that event on Saturday. Next Sunday, December 6th uh, at, woo, 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 not at one, at 12.30, got moved up half an hour because of the next thing, uh, our ministerial support, I can't say the words, ministerial assistant, that being Tessa, support committee, that being those of you who know who you are, uh, will be having a meeting on Zoom at 12.30 uh, with her to see how she's doing. And then at two o'clock next Sunday, we will meet for our first of two caroling parties. We will meet in the parking lot. We'll give you a song sheets. We'll give you directions or a list of addresses. <clears throat> this is gonna be a totally COVID safe event. You will have your mask on. We will go to someone's house in our separate household cars. We will spread out across the yard or the sidewalk or maybe even the streets spread out as far as we can and sing through our masks at the top of our lungs so we will still be heard. Uh, those of you that we are coming to sing to, I encourage you to let your neighbors know that this is happening and tell them to come out and stand in their front doors and uh, sing with us or just listen as they choose as well. So I hope you will join us next Sunday at 2. Uh, like I said, we will meet here in the parking lot, and sadly, we will not end with a pizza party at Tim and Karen's house, because, uh, you know. So, there's a lot going on this week. Um, we do not have, uh, we have very few people in this church who were born in the month of December. However, on Tuesday, it is uh, Gerald, uh, Geraldine Berry, uh, our nursery assistant, Francia's oldest daughter, Jerry, uh, will have her birthday on Tuesday. I'm pretty sure she's not here, right, Julie? So I think we will not sing this song today. However, if you will find your little signs before we come to worship God, Jesus teaches us to reconcile ourselves one to another. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with all of you, and thank you for those lovely symbols of Christ's reconciling peace. And now as we begin worship, if you have your Advent devotional booklet with you, I invite you to turn to page 42 to the candle lighting service for the first Sunday which will be led by our worship leader, Walter Rory Beatty, our lay reader, Lisa Martin, and our elders, Tim Cliff and Becky Neely. Let us begin. Walt's a little combobulated. He'll be right there. Okay. Hit a, sorry, I had uh, technical difficulties. But, uh, so, today we celebrate the first Sunday of Advent and we light the candle of hope. In a world too often filled with uncertainty and anxiety, we rejoice in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1, 5-9, we hear the gratitude and hope that Paul has in God and in the gift of Jesus. All right, the second reading is a reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
He will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him, you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Advent is a time of anticipation when we remember how the expectant hope of the world was fulfilled in the coming of Jesus and how we lay claim to the hope that we have in Christ every day. Through Christ, God promises to strengthen us as we live into the call to be Jesus's disciples. We find our hope also in the scriptures. We find our hope also in the scriptures where we read in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, God is faithful. May our hearts lay hold to this hope today and every day. And may the light of this candle remind us of God's enduring faithfulness. I invite you now to light the candle. It's right there. Get your Advent square read carefully. There is a purple square with a tiny little number one. And I invite you to light a tea light on that square. As I fail to light, let me try one more time. I'm not even three feet tall. This should be easier. Here we go. The candle of hope. And now Walter will lead us in our opening prayer. Our hope is in you, Lord. Fill us with the hope you give, the hope that sustains us and gives us strength in the days ahead, the hope that does not disappoint. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And now I invite you to join in singing the first verse of O Come All Ye Faithful. Uh, keeping yourself muted so that the video will not be interrupted. And it will take just a moment. I love that you can actually See that candle flame right there. Julie, you are muted. I'm not sure if that means we won't hear or not. into a spirit of prayer as we share the joys and concerns of this community and beyond. 
I will first lift up the prayer concerns that we have received already by various means, and then we will have time for you to add to our prayers as you need to. As we lift up each request, I will either say, God in your mercy, to which we will respond, hear our prayer, or God with joyful hearts, to which we will respond, we give you thanks. We lift up Sandy Hanna and her family on the passing of her uncle Tony this past Thursday. As you know, his wife Sandy's Aunt Jeannie just passed away the week before. They had both been uh, very ill. She was with COVID and I'm not sure uh, what his diagnosis ever was, but we pray for Sandy and for her cousins. She uh, will be traveling back to Las Vegas this week to help her cousins with the house. And we also need to pray, pray for Sandy's brother-in-law, Mike, who had a stroke last night. So many, many prayers for Sandy Hannah and her family. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We are praying as well for Chrissy Frost, who was hospitalized on Wednesday after an assault. She is uh, supposed to be having surgery, uh, last I heard, supposed to be having surgery on Sunday to fix a broken jaw. And we are also holding uh, Tegan and Tiana in our prayers as they go through that uh, with their mom and for uh, Lisa and Mike as they support Christy through that as well. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. A little bit of good news. Vicki Adsit got her trach out on Friday. This is very exciting. Um, they were not necessarily expecting that to happen, but the doctor said that she was doing uh, well enough in all directions that that could happen. She will have to wait a few weeks while the incision heals, but uh, she is doing well. So we rejoice with Vicki. God, with joyful hearts, we give you thanks. We continue to pray for Lace Watkins' mom, Bobby, as she is struggling after a stroke a number of weeks ago, she is on dialysis. She is very weak. She's been going back and forth between a nursing home rehab and the hospital. Uh, so we pray for Bobby and uh, her husband, Hubert, and for Lise as she supports them through that. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I am asking your prayers for uh, the daughter of a friend of mine from college, my Friend Ed, uh, his 10-year-old daughter, is going to be having open back surgery tomorrow because they have found a tumor at the base of her spine. Um, as you can imagine, this is very scary for a 10-year-old and for her parents. They don't know yet what the tumor is, so there is um, a lot of anxiety and a lot of things to worry about. So prayers for 10-year-old Lila and her father, Ed, and the whole family. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We continue to hold Katie Yoder in our prayers. She has had her MRI. She is waiting till the 11th for the stress test that is required before her surgery. As you know, this has been a very long, very frustrating process of waiting and waiting and waiting. So we continue to wait and pray with Katie. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up Brenda Rory Beatty as well, uh, who has had uh, expanded cancer um, found, and she is still waiting for a referral to an oncologist at UCSD. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Are there other things? I see some things came up in the chat box. Uh, Julie, if you could lift those up for me. Uh, Edith, Daphne, <laughs> sorry. Daphne says uh, prayers for our family and prayers for Hempston. Okay, so we do pray for the Flores family and especially this day we pray for Hempston. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Is there anything else from the chat box? And Kathy says, my sister-in-law, Sarah, having some not yet diagnosed neurological issues. Okay, we pray for Kathy Mulliken's uh, sister-in-law, Sarah, who is having some as yet undiagnosed neurological issues. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. If you would like to, I think, I think Becky might be raising the hand. I will let you call on folks as you can see hands. 
Uh, there's also another one. Um, Lisa says Christina has come through surgery this morning. Fine. Okay, we give thanks. Christy has come through surgery this morning and is doing well. God, with joyful hearts, we give you thanks. Becky, if you were waving your hand, wave it again. Okay, go ahead, Becky. Yeah, I'm having a lot of um, problems in my left ear to where I can barely hear out of it. And it feels like there's a lot of pressure built up. So I have emailed the doctor to um, see if I can get in and see him and see what's going on in there now. Okay, so for Becky, problems in God in mercy. Yes. Um, the people of Ethiopia. Okay. There is, is much unrest going on in Ethiopia and one particular uh, rebel-held region. We pray for the people of Ethiopia for hope and peace. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Uh, from Walt, Sam had an allergic reaction at work yesterday. We still don't know what he reacted to. Okay, so we pray for Sam Rory, who has recently moved to Yuma, right? Is that right, Walt? Let's shake your head. Yes? Okay. Sam moved to Yuma for a new job and had an allergic reaction to something unknown. So we pray for Sam and that that will get figured out and never happen again. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Does it seem like that's it, Julie? Thank you. Let us continue in prayer. God of hope, we come before you today with hearts that are full of fears, of worries, of grudges and jealousies, resistance and weariness. We come in hopes that you might transform us that you might help us remember the hope we know in Christ Jesus. We bring you our pain, that you might reveal your presence once again beside us and within us, sustaining us and restoring us in the face of all brokenness. The present moment is overwhelming, oh God. So we ask that you would strengthen us to get through each hour and day. There are so many who are hurting, so we pray your compassion and grace might surround them. As we enter into this season of waiting and preparation, we give you thanks for helping us recognize that our world is not as it should be, and for equipping us to build it anew through the power of your love. Make our hope an active practice, God that we might be vessels of your transformation. We pray it all in the name of the one coming into the world, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our second reading today comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. Mark 13, 24 through 37. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the son of man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is here at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven
heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. May the Holy Spirit add blessing to this reading from the gospel. Will you pray with me and for me as we move into the word together? Holy God, bless the speaking and the hearing of these words that we might be strengthened by the revelation of Jesus Christ in our lives. In the name of the one coming into the world, amen. Some of you may not be aware that the recommended scriptures for the season of Advent are often pulled from the apocalyptic passages like the verses from Mark 13 we just heard. I have to take some responsibility for that gap in your knowledge because Usually, I have tried to avoid the end of the world warnings that the designers of the lectionary seem to think we should ponder in these waning days of the year. Most years, I've chosen to explore the Advent themes of hope, peace, joy, and love, or created an entire sermon series instead. It's almost Christmas after all. Who wants to contemplate the end of the world? But this is Advent 2020, and I'm not convinced that the apocalypse scares us anymore. Sun refusing to shine? Of course it is. Moon hiding its light? That figures. Stars falling from the sky? Not a big surprise. In the verses just before the passage we read, Jesus is warning that the apocalypse will be especially hard on those who are pregnant or nursing infants, which we pretty much already knew by now. He says to watch out for false prophets trying to lead us astray and to pray that it won't happen in winter. For in those days there will be suffering such as has not been until now, he says. Well, here we go. It's highly likely that today is the day that San Diego County will surpass 1,000 deaths from COVID-19. Over the past few months, in the emails the school sends out to alums, the president of my seminary, Reverend David Vasquez Levy, has been reminding us that one meaning of the word apocalypse is revealing or revelation. This pandemic has certainly revealed a lot. The weaknesses in our leadership systems, the gaping holes in our healthcare safety nets, the deadly impact of racial disparities, the previously hidden or ignored extra labor of women, but also the enormous latent creativity and adaptability of parents and teachers and churches and so many others, the dedication of our healthcare workers, the deep resilience of our children, the courage of those public leaders who dare to tell us what we need to hear rather than what we want to hear. So far, we've been able to hold it together mostly through this lived revelation, partially by almost 
anthropomorphizing the year 2020 itself into some kind of malevolent demon full of nasty surprises. So a little apocalypse for Advent this year isn't really going to feel all that different than what's already been happening. On the other hand, blaming everything on 2020 might be setting ourselves up for disappointment once January arrives. It's the first Sunday of Advent and we're supposed to be learning about hope. What does hope look like when the pandemic we'd hoped would be under control by now is instead ravaging our communities and throwing our hospitals into crisis at levels beyond the emergency alerts of summer. This renewed demand on our patience and endurance could easily become too much to bear. We always knew we could get to the end of the year even when we felt like giving up. But what if the end of the year brings no relief? How on earth will we hold on longer than that? It's important to remember that for the early Christians, the apocalypse was about hope. They didn't fear it, they welcomed it because it meant Jesus was coming back. Things would be put right again, or even for the very first time. And for a while at least, they were pretty sure that miraculous setting right was happening soon. Any day now, probably tomorrow, if not tonight. This generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place, Jesus says here in Mark. But some of those folks were getting pretty old. Keeping awake was getting harder and harder as the years stretched on. The strain of staying vigilant day in and day out is exhausting. Sleeping through the whole thing sounds like a lovely alternative, doesn't it? So how do we keep awake while we're waiting for this slow motion end of the world to end? How do we keep hope awake when the suffering all around us is increasing rather than dissipating? I have no dramatic answer for you. It turns out that Jesus' instructions for living through the end of the world are the same as his instructions for living in general. The promise from 1 Corinthians is for us today as well. Give thanks for the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end. It's the end of the world as we know it. And he has shown us, O oh mortals, what is good to love God and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Need more? We've been over this recently and the instructions don't change just because the apocalypse is upon us. What does the Lord require of us? Let us love our enemies and welcome strangers. Let us lay down our lives for our friends that all might have life and have it abundantly. Whether the call of the gospel on a particular day is to serve hot coffee to cold strangers in the parking lot while wearing face masks, or to stay home rather than mingling in public, love is the guide that Jesus would have us follow. Loving our neighbors 
is how we find hope in the midst of the world falling apart. It turns out the end of the world isn't in our hands. We may feel like that's what's happening, but Jesus reminds us that even he didn't really know when it was coming. All we can take charge of is the meantime. In the meantime, we can wash our hands and wear our masks and leave space between ourselves and others for germs to fall to their deaths on the ground and resist the urge to go out and about to keep everyone's exposure limited so our hospitals aren't overwhelmed. These small acts of love are how we keep hope awake. We wear our masks faithfully now in hopes of one day thinking of them as souvenirs. We visit with family over the phone or the internet in hopes of one day all gathering around the same table again. Jesus has shown us how to live with love and hope. These endurance skills are the spiritual gifts we need for Advent this year and beyond. The strength we gain from Jesus is the power of love to maintain our vigilance in the face of lockdown fatigue and restlessness. Preparing for the Christ child to enter into our lives and our world again can help us renew our commitment to living with sacrificial love and generous faithfulness in the face of continuing hardship. As this revealing unfolds, there may indeed be a new earth on the other side. Let us keep awake. Let us keep hope awake so that we're ready to welcome it when it comes, just as we welcome Christ into our hearts. Alleluia and amen. It is at this time, that's actually too soon, Julie. It is at this time that we invite anyone who wishes to join this faith community to indicate that by waving your hand and we will call on you should you wave your hand. It is at this time that we are all invited to rededicate our hearts and our lives to the ministry of Jesus Christ. And now I invite you to join in singing the first verse of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, keeping yourself muted so the video can play without interruption. You'd be amazed how many you'd be amazed how many buttons we see.
an invitation to the offering. Our Bible study group has just completed a reading of Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, in which the apostle asks the church in Corinth to provide material assistance to the needy who are in Jerusalem, sisters and brothers there. Paul makes three points that I think bear repeating. First, he knows that for Christians, giving to the church and others in need is always a thankful response to what we have already received. The Corinthian offering is not an act of goodness on their part. It's an act of gratitude for the goodness of God. Second, given to others is a sign of our unity in the body of Christ and in God's one creation. What happens to one, he insists, happens to us all. And third, giving is never a matter of coercion. Each of you, he writes, should give not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. May the apostles' words resonate in our lives as we come with our offerings. As we prepare to dedicate our offerings, I invite you to hold yours up in view or just lift up a hand or your phone as a symbol of an online gift or the gift of your heart and time. And now Tim Cliff will give our offering dedication prayer. Dear Lord, we bring these tithes and these offerings today passionately in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. These gifts represent a part of what we each individually are passionate about. And they represent, too, the things for which we passionately hope. In this season of Advent, it is only proper to consider the life into which Jesus would be born and the life into which Jesus would grow up and into the life that Jesus would give away and to ask what this Jesus of Nazareth himself would be most passionate about. And the answer that scripture keeps coming back to us with is that Jesus of Nazareth was passionate about God and passionate about the kingdom of God. This is the passion of Jesus that we so eagerly await in this season of Advent. This is the passion of Jesus that is commemorated when we light our first candle of Advent dedicated to hope. This is the passion of Jesus that breaks forth as the light of the world in a world of darkness and loneliness, and hopelessness, and broken dreams, and despair. This is the passion of Jesus from which we find strength from weakness, life out of death, and treasure out of giving. Bless these givers today. Bless these gifts today, that they might help build the body of Christ and further the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, we passionately pray, amen. amen. And now I invite you to uh, find whatever it is you are going to use for communion today. Have it there to partake of when we are ready. What would you eat for dinner if you knew the world was ending tomorrow. We hear stories of death row inmates making special and sometimes strange requests for their last meal, fried chicken, steak, five pounds of cheese. If we were told to pick a menu for our last meal, we would probably focus on our favorite foods. But that's not what Jesus did. In his last meal before the world, as he knew it was going to end, he focused on the needs of others rather than his own preferences. 
He broke the bread, not because he was craving carbs, but so that we could learn about the wholeness God can bring out of brokenness. He blessed the cup, not because he really enjoyed wine, but because he wanted us to understand the power of pouring out our lives in sacrificial love. When the world feels like it's ending, we are called to live just as we've been trying to live all along, with ultimate reverence before God and deep compassion for everyone else. It was through this supposedly last supper that Jesus showed us how hope is sustained by living for others. So we come to this table and remember that on the night before Jesus was to be crucified, he gathered with his disciples and he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Eat of it, all of you, and remember me. In a similar way, he took up the cup. And having given thanks, he poured it out for them saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Drink of it, all of you, and remember me. And so we come share in this meal giving thanks for the hope we know in Christ's sacrificial love. And now Becky Neely will lead us in Let's pray. Father God, as we enter into this holy season of Advent, help us to remember the true meaning of the season that no matter what is going on in the world around us, you are the reason that we gather, no matter where we may be today and every other Sunday. Be with us, Lord, as we share in this meal that reminds us of your presence. May this bread and cup help us to welcome Emmanuel, God with us. Grant us peace and love in our hearts. And now let us join together in the saying of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now partake. We will conclude our service today by singing the first verse of It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Oops. And if you're not muted, we'll hear you singing.
thanks for the gift of hope that we know in Christ, in our hearts, in our lives, in our family of faith, and in our world. Let us carry forth the light of hope by living out the love of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Go in peace. Amen.